Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. The case of State of Iowa versus Scott Luke is hereby submitted without oral argument. Our first oral argument this morning is Myers versus City of Cedar Falls, and it looks like both of the attorneys are ready to go. Mr. Anderson? Yes. Okay, and you are the applicant, correct? Yeah. Aren't you the applicant from further review, though? Oh, yes. Yes, I Okay. So, yes. <laughs> May it please the court and counsel. Uh, my name is Sam Anderson. I represent the city of Cedar Falls in this matter. Um, there's two big points I'd like to raise on this issue. Uh, on this issue. Um, it's been thoroughly briefed. Uh, from the brief, I think we showed, first point, from the brief, I believe we showed that regardless of the approach the court might wanna take on this, uh, the city is entitled to the summary judgment granted by the district court whether you're following Iowa Code Chapter 135I, whether you're following uh, Iowa Administrative Code uh, 641 Chapter 15, whether you're following this, the Sanon decision or whether you're following the Sanon dissent. Uh, the plaintiff in this case would have the court apply a, a negligence standard as to whether the city committed the criminal offense or have a jury determine what the meaning of a uh, uh, determine the, the parameters of a crime, and that's untenable, as I pointed out in my brief. The second point on a broader, on a broader range is the interpretation of, I, I, of chapter 135I is really not all that difficult if, it's, if you read it all together. We can't forget that uh, in 1989, 89 Acts chapter 291 created both the authorization and structure for pool regulation and enforcement, and the immunity set up by uh, 670.4 uh, Pren 1, Pren L. This has to mean something. Um, the legislature said uh, simply, we will give the Iowa Department of Public Health at that time, and uh, as of uh, this summer, uh, the, the department was changed from the Iowa Department of Public Health to the Iowa Department of Inspection, Appeals, and Licensing. That's significant because it sort of takes away the arguments of the uh, majority in the, uh, the Santa decision uh, to, to read the Department of Public Health into all, into, uh, all their uh, obligations under the other 135 chapters into 135I, because now 135I, the department is uh, the Department of Inspections, Appeals, and Licensing. Uh, the legislature said, Basically, we will give this department the responsibility to register and regulate uh, the operation of municipal pools. Um, that's in 135I subpart four. In return, any municipality that is inspected pursuant to 135I and registered is entitled to immunity uh, for claims violated for claims related to pool unless the act or omission is done with actual malice or is a criminal offense. Actual malice is not uh, an issue in this case. And as the dissent pointed out in Sanon, the purpose was of this was to reduce the litigation risk uh, uh, associated with aquatic recreation. I mean, people run, people do stupid things at pools. Uh, and this case is a, is a perfect example of that. Yeah, you know, I believed what I wrote at the time, but the dissent's not the law. But I, I also wrote in the dissent that um, I, quote, I invite the legislature to take a fresh lo look at the scope of tort immunity for municipal swimming pools in light of today's decision. That was 2015. Did they ever do I, an, any subsequent enactment um, overrule the Sanon majority? One thing that I think is, I mean, important to me is that they, they turn the, this over to the inspection, the Department of Inspection uh, um, licensing and registering. I mean, the whole purpose of that is what this is. Um, and... Um, By what you just said, you said they turned it over to the inspection of, are you talking about the most recent it was in two, my understanding is in 2023, this last summer, 
clarify your, what you were talking about, but that was after the events that we're talking about today, right? Plus, Your Honor, I, I think um, that part of the, I mean, th I think the, uh, the majority decision in Sanon was muddled and, and, uh, and not correctly decided, and some of the reaction and the d dissent was to offset what, was, what had happened, rather than taking a fresh look at what does the statute say. And, and this, this statute, um, uh, you know, it gives the power to regulate, uh, and the power they, they did to regulate uh, was giving the department uh, the power to revoke the registration of the pool or to order a pool closed uh, or equipment uh, not be used. Um, Your arguments are are essentially asking us to overturn Sanon, though, right? I mean, your statutory. Okay, um, so. I don't think it's for, for us to get to summary judgment, but yes. Is, On that point, then, um, have any of, sometimes when we're looking at whether or not we should be overruling a prior case that addresses statutory interpretation, um, have any of the problems that were identified in the dissent um, come to fruition in this case that would require us to overrule? Because couldn't, the, the General Assembly could have in response to Justice Waterman's dissent, either done what he asked, or they could have doubled down and said, no, we meant exactly what the majority said. They didn't do either, it seems like. Um, but in, in this situation, had they just said, okay, we meant provisions of this chapter as well as rules of the department, um, could they, that's I guess my first question, could they have done that? Good case to show how untenable that result would be because the- Had they done that, would, would you be here arguing? Had they, can you state that again, Your Honor? The, in response to Sanon, had the legislature said, um, amended 135I.5 and said, oh, we meant what the majority in Sanon said. And so that applies to violations of provisions of the code, but also to violations of the rules. That. But if they had, then it wouldn't, does that create the problems that were identified in the dissent? If I understand your question, I, I don't think, I mean, they haven't done that. And um, the, I think our case shows the problems of, of Sanon as it exists. Uh, and they haven't changed the rules. Uh, and I think that, I think the only, uh, the on, the, under the statute, the only uh, misdemeanor that would be caused under the statute, 135I, would be operating without a registration, quite frankly. Thank you, and I, yeah, I apologize, I'm not explaining myself very well, but so when we look at prior cases, that whether or not we should overrule them, one of the things we look at are whether or not kind of some of the problems that are sometimes identified in a dissent, as Justice, Justice Waterman's, have those occurred that, that say, you know, Sandin really was wrong and now it's really creating problems, so we need to fix it now. Well, I think, I'm sorry, I'm just still not quite getting the, the I think the, uh, the problems of Sanon still exist and the, the legislature, uh, I don't know whether it's brought, been brought to their attention, but uh, I don't know that they have uh, responded by saying, hey, the, here's these problems we're going, they, we really mean it. Let me follow up on where Justice Oxley is, is, has been going, maybe. Um, I mean, could we say that this case, in a sense, illustrates the problems because you had the Court of Appeals applied Sanon and the District Court applied Sanon, and they came to different uh, results. Uh, Judge Allers seemed to be of the view that it was for the jury simply to decide if there was an adequate you know, sort of non, non slip surface uh, on the diving board. And um, that was all that Sanon required to get to the jury. I think you and the district court had a different view. Could that suggest that maybe whether Sanon is good policy or bad policy, it's maybe not all that easy to apply? Clarified. 
and that's that's what I think. That's why I'm trying to think, express that it's simple. You know, if you read the statutes, I mean, it's set up. It, it's set up to say, okay, if you registered, you follow the rules, and you're registered, you, you know, you're not committing any misdemeanor under 135I. And part of the problem is, cities don't commit misdemeanors, right? It has to be a person. It has to be a person. You have to identify a person who's committed a misdemeanor. Sanon said, and I think Justice Waterman and I agreed with this part of the decision. It was a preponderance of the evidence. Sanon said, you know, you have to identify an actual criminal violation, but then you only have to prove it by a preponderance. But you still have to find a criminal violation. And just saying the city did something or maybe didn't do something doesn't necessarily establish a criminal violation. Exactly true, and and um, I mean the the process is is set up to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, um, one, there I think the criminal violation has to do with whatever crimes are out there. You know, you could you could assault somebody. You can do all these other things at a pool that would be a crime, criminal conduct. Uh, or you know you could commit the misdemeanor of operating a pool, I suppose, without a registration. Um, someone who does it. Someone has to do it. Uh, I don't think that. I think if the city or cities are held liable for, um, um, you know, having a board that is not sufficiently, someone thinks that the board is not sufficiently. Uh, slip resistant, even though you have a slip resistant board, or for all of the different regulations where the pool chemicals are not quite right on a given day, and someone gets, I mean, those can't be misdemeanors. That 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 becomes untenable, and there's a process to go by. And the I think the Iowa Administrative Code has set up the process in conformity with the the statute where. Uh, the the uh, the state approves the pool. They approve everything in the pool before you start it. They they inspect you every year, and as long as you're abiding by that, you are entitled to this immunity. Uh, if there is a problem, what can happen is the the state says we want you to correct this. Uh, we give you a chance to correct this. We'll tell you how to correct it. In this case, the state when they came in in June. This happened in July. The, if, when the state came in in June, if, if they saw our board was was insufficiently, they thought was insufficiently slip resistant, they could say, you know, we need you to replace your board or do whatever, take it out of service. What do we do with the fact in this case that it, there isn't anything that says the rule is only violated if the city is informed by an in inspector that there's some problem. And that was one of the points I think that, that the Court of Appeals is trying to make here. The problem is the, that does the, 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 the rule violations themselves, I don't think create the misdemeanor. I think the misdemeanor comes when you've had notice to correct everything, that the administrative procedures followed through everything. And they say, okay, you know what? You're not complying. We're going to revoke your your license. And you thumb your nose at the at the uh, department. Then you probably got a misdemeanor. Or when they go through the, you know, they have to they have to enforce it uh, through the district attorney or the the uh, attorney general. Then you might you might reach that level. But you can't have if you have a situation where every little deviation from a regulation, pool regulation, is considered a crime, then the immunity that is given to the city as part of the deal, you, you register, you, you, you get inspected every year, you get this immunity because we know that people slip and fall and do stupid stuff at pools. If you let every single rule uh, deviation become a misdemeanor, then the, the immunity is essentially meaningless. Uh, and so I think the process is there. And if the process isn't followed, I don't see how you can just create, create it as a misdemeanor. Um, 
it, it makes everything meaningless. Um, and I think that's, that's all I had to, to say. I think everything else is pretty much briefed if anybody has any questions. Overrule precedent, to some extent, there's a view we're undermining the predictability and, and uh, certainty the, the, that we need in our, our law. Can you respond to that? Or? Predictability is set up here. I mean, because here you've got a rule. You've got a rule that says you have to have a, a non-slip resistant uh, uh, a slip resistant diving board. We put one in, okay? And at some point in time, somebody thinks, well, that's worn down to the fact that it's not sufficiently. Well, there's no standards for that. So how on earth is the pool to know that it's ventured into some kind of misdemeanor unless the reg regulatory agency has said, you need to correct this. If they say you need to correct this and you've had the opportunity to be heard, like they give you the process to do, and you still thumb your nose at it, maybe, maybe you're, you're entitled to be punished for that. But I mean, uh, you've gotta know, you've gotta know what, what you violated. In this situation, there's no, there was no way for, the pool thought it was sufficient. The pool operator here thought it was sufficient. Evidently, uh, the inspectors that came in uh, thought it was sufficient. They came in every year. They were never cited for, the, for that, so how would, uh, how would that ever become, how could you ever raise that to the level of a misdemeanor? Um, and what's worse would be to, to have every single case like this, well, let, let's ask a jury what, whether they think this is sufficient. I mean, one, they're interpreting the law, uh, which is not their, their job, and two, they would essentially be uh, using a negligence standard for purpose, that's what would happen. And you, you, this diving board would be held to a different standard than this diving board. I mean, Your Honor, I think I've said everything. Everything is set forth in, in my brief. Thank you. May it please the court, counsel, Tom Duff for not the applicant. Um, this court is being asked to overrule that portion of the case, Sanon versus City of Pella, which held that a criminal offense can be established by a rule promulgated by the Department of Health. That's the 4-3 decision. What is not before the court is whether a statutory criminal offense falls within that same ex exception. The, even the dissenters agreed that uh, in Sanon you could use the manslaughter statute to establish uh, a criminal offense. Um, the dissent in Santa, as has been pointed out uh, this morning, um, there was some concerns that were raised uh, by the dissent, uh, which none of which have come to fruition. One of those was that unelected bureaucrats would expand criminal or civil liability. There's no evidence in the record that that occurred. Another concern was that it would become more costly for cities and schools to keep their pools and that insurance rates would rise uh, on the swimming pools. Again, there's no evidence in the record that either of those things occurred. And as Justice Waterman pointed out this morning, he did raise a red flag to the legislature which said, you all need to look at this majority opinion and, and take a look at it and uh, decide whether that is what you want the law to be. And in fact, since Sanon, uh, was written in 2015, we're now eight plus years past Sanon. The legislature has gone into to chapter six, section 670.4 multiple times, and every time they've added immunities and expanded the scope of who is covered by the act. In 2018, they added immunity for honey bee hive construction of all things. In 2019, they expanded the definition of municipalities so more entities would be covered. In 2020, they added new immunity for equipment for firefighters and first responders. And in 2021, uh, the court is well aware that they created an entire new section, 670.4A, which uh, um, creates qualified immunity and greatly expands the protections for cities and counties for claims for money damages. What they did not do 
is attempt. There's no evidence in the record that they even, there was ever any discussion about amending the swimming pool exception. Um, the court should uphold uh, Sanin based on the doctrines of stare decisis and legislative acquiescence. In the case we cited in our brief, State B, Iowa District Court for Jones County, the court there addressed a question of whether to adhere to previous, a previous decision, Holm, the Holm case, regarding the interpretation of 903A.2. But uh, let, me, let me try and argue for the dissent's position in Salmon a little bit. Um, it, it is really odd to read 135.38. It says, any person who knowing, knowingly violates any provision of this chapter <coughs> or of the rules of the department shall be guilty of a simple misdemeanor. So if you say it, it would be odd to have a provision in one section that make, creates a simple misdemeanor only of the statutory violations in that section, but of any rule issued by the department, which now would extend to the Department of Inspections and Appeals, especially given that all those other sections, as the dissent pointed out, have their own uh, criminal provisions. It's just a curious reading of that language that I think is ambiguous. Any provision of this chapter or the rules of the department, rules seems to me to mean any rules that also fall within this chapter. Um, what, you know, how, how do you make heads or tails out of that? My response would be to, as best I can, restate what the majority opinion was, which was that the legislature in enacting 135I.5 did not intend to modify 135.38, but created a comprehensive regulatory screen, uh, scheme. Um, I think one other thing that I don't believe was raised in the uh, Sanin case um, was if you look at 135I, it is the enabling statute. 135I.45 gives the Department of uh, Health authority to promulgate rules and regulations for the implementation and enforcement of the statute. And then there is chapter 15A of the administrative code, which is entitled or titled swimming pools and spas. And if you scroll down to the end of that, or that uh, administrative rule section, it says these rules are intended to implement Iowa code chapter 135I. If you look, I mean, and when you read 135I, the only section that you could possibly violate would be the registration section, which doesn't make much sense. And it, to me, it makes, I think if you read the statute and the regulations together, what they're saying is the agency has the authority to make the rules and regulations. And in the agency's rules and regulations, they also say violations of these are simple misdemeanors. So it's both in the regulation and in 135. <laughs> I, if that makes sense. That 135I came to be at the same time as 670.412. Um, well, I think the, uh, I, I think the answer to that is that they, uh, um, that 135.38 um, should be read in tandem with 135I.5. One violating, uh, criminalizing violations of department rules and the other criminalizing violations of the statute. So uh, the fact that the two were passed together, I'm not sure is, is um, dispositive of the issue in this case. Um, you know, we're, let's say we're, we're, we're sticking by Sanon. Then we still have the separate issue that um, there has to be proof that somebody knowingly violated a rule of the department, correct? Correct. And it only has to be proof, but preponderance of the evidence, that's what we all agreed on in Sanon, but there still has to be proof. So who's the person who, there's a fact issue whether they knowingly violated a rule of the department. Who's the actual individual? In this case, there's, there's two individuals, Mr. Schoentag and uh, Mr. Barrink. They are, uh, one's the aquatic supervisor and the other's the recreations manager. They testified that every year in the spring, they 
when they put the board in, they inspect it. When they, in the fall, when they take it out, they inspect it. One of the things that they check for is the, the grit on the board and whether it's um, you know, sufficiently not non-slip. Um, they are, I, I think the evidence in the record is that those two gentlemen are, they're sophisticated and knowledgeable. Uh, they knew about the regulation. They knew about the non-slip regulation. I asked them both of them about it. They both were aware of it. And they understood how the regulation worked in the real world. I asked Mr. Barrink about, did you know about the regulation? Yes, and tell me what the regulation means and how do you apply it? And he essentially said, well, if the, if the board is, uh, we're looking for is to make sure that the board is, has enough grit on it that somebody's foot doesn't fly out when they jump on the board which is pretty straightforward, and that is what, these, what the, uh, the rule calls for. Um, so they, they my, our expert, well, there's two things, I guess. You can look at the photographs of the board, which are in the record, and you can tell that the board at the end where, at, where people jump on it is worn down. The, the rivets or the buttons on the board are worn down. Uh, our expert, looked at the board and said that sort of deterioration of the board occurs over time. It had to have been going on for months or maybe years before Mr. Myers was injured. So when these gentlemen are taking the board in and out and inspecting it, they had to have seen, or at least a fact issue is created, that they had to have seen that the board was losing its uh, grit. Do you agree that it's not enough for you to show a fact issue. This isn't like a negligence per se, garden variety tort case. You, it's not enough to show there's a fact issue whether the board was slippery or not. You have to show a fact issue as to whether at least one individual who works for the city knowingly violated the, the regulation, correct? That it was, uh, that it was sufficiently non-slippery. And I think the, the, there's a fact issue because you know, they're inspecting the board. You can look at the board. You can run your hand over the board, and you can easily tell that it's, there's grit here, and it's smooth right where people are jumping on it. That um, that, that person would then use to determine whether or not it was sufficiently slip resistant. What standard would that person be applying to determine whether it was sufficiently slip resistant that it failed to meet the rule? And so how would you describe that or instruct that to a jury? It's, I think it's a simple um, negligence. If they, if they knew about the, uh, knew that the board was slippery or there was a fact issue that they knew or should have known. The rule doesn't say it can't be slippery, it just says that it has to have a slippery resistant um, condition. Right. Um, and that's what the board did here. Surface, yeah. Surface. Um, and so having a slippery resistant surface then isn't slippery for these two people. How would you instruct that? I'm sorry, how would you instruct that to the jury for them to decide whether or not um, that, that board had a slip resistant surface? That would have to be the instruction to the jury is if you find that the, the board at the time that Mr. Myers jumped on the board that it did not have a slip resistant surface, then you may find that they were negligent. Does that leave that to the jury then to decide uh, how much friction essentially needs to be slip resistant? Juries in Iowa all the time decide whether the grocery store floor is, uh, is slippery, whether a parking lot is slippery. So those are, um, that's something that juries, I think is well within their capability of determining. I mean, you don't have to show that, I don't think there's any requirement that you show the coefficient of friction of the of the floor of the diving board was whatever it would have to be. Right, but it's, you know, again, I, I hate to keep harping on this, but there is a difference between creating a, a fact issue whether the board was slippery and somebody sh should have recognized it was slippery and therefore unsafe. That would be sort of an ordinary negligence standard. And somebody knowingly violated a regulation that requires a non-slip sur uh, non surface. And 
it seems to me those are two different ways that you would have to instruct the jury, right? The jury would have to find that there was not a slip resistant surface and they would also have to find that the city of Cedar Falls through their agents uh, knew that there was not, that that condition did not exist, that it was a uh, not a slip resistant surface at the time Mr. Myers was injured. Last year's reorganization of state government undermined the Sanon majority by moving, you know, one department into another. I thought about that. I, I, I don't think it would. I mean, um, I'm not really familiar with exactly what, what occurred, but um, I wouldn't think that that would affect the, uh, the, the viability. I.1, the definition section now says department means the Department of Inspections, Appeals, and Licensing. And so now if we're going to read 135.38 to apply that, now it's all, all rules of the Department of Inspections, Appeals, and Licensing, rather than the Department um, of Health that it was before. Does that broaden? It, it sounds broader. I, I assume that the, the regulations that we're relying on in, uh, uh, in the Iowa Administrative Code still exist, and they're still being implemented by the, by the new expanded department. So I wouldn't think that it would make uh, any difference. Um, Within the rules, there's actually a rule 15.8 that says violations of this chapter constitute simple misdemeanors, and that's within the regulations themselves. So is that referring to violations of the chap chapter 15 regulations applying to, po to pools, or is that referring to the statute itself? I think it's referring, are you talking about the, the penalty provision in the administrative code? I would think that that I would think that would apply to all of the provisions in the Iowa administrative or in that section of the Iowa administrative code, and it it does reference that it's implementing 135I. So um, I see that I'm out of time. Um, we would urge that the court affirm the decision of the court of appeals and remand this case for further proceedings. Mr. Anderson? 